Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to the 2022 One Sustainability Conference, our annual global sustainability event. We now have the pleasure to welcome and introduce Jim Bardia, the inventor and patent holder of Wind and Solar Tower. And Jim will tell us more about zero emissions and EV charging. Jim, I hand over to you. I want to start by thanking you, James and uh, Stelios, for uh, uh, and and the whole team at One Sustainability for creating a platform that permits open discussion on, on a variety of climate mitigation subjects. Also, I'd like to thank each and every one of you for taking the time to listen, and especially for having an interest in advancing society and working toward maintaining a planet that can prosper and provide a habitable environment for future generations. Today, we will look at a series of facts on air pollution. I'll touch on the inconvenient truth about how dirty electric vehicles actually are. Then I will show you how my invention of the wind and solar tower can provide emission-free charging for EVs, an application well beyond its original mission of bringing electricity to off-grid populations around the world. So in a nutshell, I'll be showing you how to make pollution-free electricity for a few pennies per kilowatt hour and how that can help the world. I'm Jim Bardia. I have a background in automotive engineering, design, and the manufacturing of road-going cars, race cars, custom cars, and trucks, and drivetrain development. But I've also been an advocate of clean, renewable energy for both ecological and economic reasons. Today, I'll be speaking about a machine that I originally envisioned could prevent some of the nearly 3 million annual deaths. Deaths? caused by breathing poisonous, fumes emitted from indoor wood and dung fires, a scourge that primarily affects women and girls. This is, tragedy has been well documented by the United Nations. A fact not generally known is that 3.8 billion people around the world still cook with wood, charcoal, dung, and other forms of biomass. If these people had clean electricity, from a wind and solar tower, lives could be saved. My initial vision was to design and engineer a vertical access wind turbine that is now called the wind and solar tower. The machine could be made and installed in underdeveloped countries, enabling those countries to extricate themselves from energy poverty through the fruits of their labor. That machine manufactured in the countries where they would be used would provide electricity to the remote populations that I referred to earlier. People who might otherwise live their entire lives without the benefits of electricity, something that we in the industrialized world take for granted. It's important to understand that electricity does not guarantee prosperity. However, the absence of electricity guarantees poverty. And now let's get to the topic that's on everyone's mind. Currently, there is a worldwide mandate to convert the transportation sector to electric vehicles that are supposedly emissions-free. Unfortunately, charging EVs from the grid will not deliver us to the emissions-free promised land. That is why I've redesigned and re-engineered the wind and solar tower beyond its original application so it can now be used as a potent commercial scale EV charger. As such, my machine can provide level four, ultra fast DC 380 kilowatt, 1000 volt emission free charging. This is important because that at that charge rate will provide 328 miles of range in only 15 minutes. In addition to the convenience of providing ultra fast level four charging, my machine delivers speed without adding CO2 pollution to the atmosphere. So why would that be important? Because without emissions free charging, electric vehicles are only 39.2% emission free. And that's because 60.8% of the US electric grid and your electric car 
is powered by burning dirty coal, oil, and gas. Now, I'm neither a climate activist or a climate denier. I'm just a practical problem-solving inventor who's troubled by the world's accelerating levels of CO2. Studies have charted that since the Industrial Revolution began, approximately 200 years ago, Earth's atmospheric CO2 has increased by almost 100% over that of the preceding 200 years. And I repeat, this tremendous accumulation of CO2 occurred within the past 200 years. Obviously, at that rate, our planet will choke itself in a relatively short period of time. Humankind has created this problem through industrialization. And now it's up to us to reverse the trend while still maintaining economic growth. Common sense tells you that if you pull your car into a single car garage and leave it running, close the garage door and stay in the car, you will lose consciousness in a few minutes and suffocate soon thereafter. This magnificent, barely 8,000 mile diameter blue marble that travels through space at around 67,000 miles an hour is protected from the vacuum of space by a disproportionately thin 60 mile atmosphere that when viewed from space resembles a rubber band around a sparkling blue ball. It should be obvious to anyone that is paying attention that eventually that thin, 60-mile garage will become saturated with gases, and like the single-car garage, will not support life. Look, industrialization is overloading our planet with CO2 faster than nature's chemical plants, and there's a double meaning there, are able to process the wasteful, the waste via photosynthesis. Just think about it. Trees feed on CO2, each tree is essentially a self-contained chemical laboratory that, by using sunlight, processes CO2 and water to create carbohydrates to grow the tree, and, as if by magic, expels oxygen as a byproduct. Our trees act as filters, taking out the bad stuff and leaving behind the good stuff. Another photosynthesis goliath is algae. These sunlit energized laboratories that range in size from microscopic cells to 60 foot long kelp also generate oxygen. However, the capacity of all of these amazing natural CO2 processing plants is being overwhelmed by the CO2 emissions that we generate. This chart shows that CO2 averaged around 280 parts per million for over 9,000 years, and then shot up to 420 parts per million in only the past 200 years. Experts predict that if left unchecked, CO2 concentrations in 2075 will be double that of the pre-industrial age. One of the reasons that I'm here uh, is to talk about fire. I would say that harnessing fire is probably the first megatrend. Taming fire millions of years ago actually domesticated what had been a destructive menace. Suddenly, fire made cooking, heating, and illumination possible. It also provided security and was later used to create early tools from stone and then from metallic ores. The bottom line is that when early humans began exploiting the power of fire to improve their lives, they began altering the Earth's ecosystem by adding harmful emissions. This trend has grown for millions of years. Look, our planet has its natural filters, but they're not sufficient to overcome the changes caused by humans. We're victims of our own success. Let's look at population growth. Homo sapiens have been successful, too successful for our own good. Population growth is rocketing. For most of human history, there were fewer than 1 billion people on the planet. During the time of the agricultural revolution, around 10,000 BC, there were only 5 to 10 million people on Earth, a number roughly equal to the population 
of a modern metropolis with enormous amounts of cheap energy at its disposal, Earth's humans population has doubled from 1 billion in 1800 to 2 billion in 1930, doubled again to 4 billion in 1975, and doubled to 8 billion today. Estimates are that at current rates, the Earth's population will reach 15 billion by 2050. So let's talk about the different types of, of, of energy. It's widely accepted that the discovery of, of coal deposits set North America on an accelerated path to the Industrial Revolution of the 19th and 20th centuries. This socioeconomic advantage provided by coal-fired steam engines, steamships, trains, and construction machinery greatly advanced industrialization and improved quality of life. For example, in 1883, coal-fired high-pressure steam for heating began flowing to buildings in New York City, providing comfort and peace of mind and eliminating the need to shovel coal into furnaces and dispose of ashes. The convenience of heating one's home without doing any physical work and not producing soot did not obviate the fact that the soot, ash, and pollution were now being emitted at a steam plant that was out of sight and out of mind. Let's look at oil. Although oil was first discovered in China in 600 BC and transported by bamboo pipelines, its use didn't flourish until the discovery of oil in Pennsylvania in 1859 and later in Texas. Proving to be more convenient to use and providing versatility in manufacturing other useful products, oil quickly catalyzed economic advancement. The notion of moving goods and people almost effortlessly over wide swaths of land at speed evolved into the fossil-fueled horseless carriage. This new means of transportation permitted industrial growth to flourish in locations not adjacent to rivers and railroads. Transportation, as we have come to know, has transformed the United States into an industrial powerhouse. However, that progress has come at an unsightly and harmful, with an unsightly and harmful byproduct, pollution, which knows no geographic boundaries. Now let's take a look at electricity. Simultaneously with the commercialization of oil, electricity was on, on a fast track to creating the ubiquitous power source that we innocently and somewhat carelessly take for granted. Beginning in 1791 with the work of uh, Luigi Galvani and uh, Alessandro Volta, and in 1821 with Michael Faraday's invention of the electric motor, the cornerstone of electrification for the developed world was set. A perfect example of this is easily demonstrated by 20th century U.S. history. In, the in 1910, only 10% of U.S. households were electrified. By 1918, 33% of U.S. households had electricity. By 1931, 85% of U.S. homes were electrified. During that short time span of 21 years, widespread distribution of electricity transformed the United States from a nation of ice boxes to refrigerators and from riverside mills to inland factories. Using electricity, to power the country's extraordinary industrial growth. But good intentions, defective planning, maybe we need a reality check. Quoting Dylan, you don't have to be a weatherman to know which way the wind blows. Likewise, I don't have to have a I don't have to be a climate scientist to know where the world is heading. I'm just a common sense inventor who owes his success to a keen sense of the obvious. This brings me to the major topic of this talk, pollution associated with EV charging and what can be done about it. Since the power for electric car charging originates in power plants, common sense and elementary math show that transferring the CO2 emission from tailpipes to smokestacks does not represent progress. It doesn't make driving emission-free. 
Recently, under the direction of seemingly well-meaning bureaucrats, the industrialized world has embarked on a path to transforming fossil fuel driving to zero emission driving, but not so fast. The math is wrong. You see, unless those vehicles are charged with zero emission power, it is impossible for them to perform as advertised. That is, zero emission vehicles. Think about it. Virtually every time an EV is plugged in, its charging power originates from a utility. In the US overall, more than 60% of those utilities burn coal, oil, or gas. Therefore, the so-called zero emission vehicle are only 39.2% emission free. A step in the right direction, but not as clean as, as, and green as the 100% that EV owners are led to believe. An inconvenient reality that impedes reaching the lofty goal of zero emissions is the fact that in the US, I repeat, 60.8% of its electricity is generated by burning fossil fuels. Much like our coffee makers, air conditioners, refrigerators, entertainment systems, computers, and phones, EVs can only be as clean as the electricity used to power them. Simply transferring that electric load to fossil fuel burning power plants will not get us to the clean planet paradise that we've been led to believe in. Let's take a look at EV chargers. Some of the world's largest manufacturers of electrical hardware have entered the EV charging space. Publicly traded industrial giants such as Siemens with an $80 billion market cap and ABB at 49 billion are now manufacturing EV charging systems. In addition to Siemens and ABB, US EV charger suppliers such as Tesla, EVgo, Wallbox, Allego, NOS Technologies, Blink Charging, Alltech Energy, Compleo Charging, and Volta and Beam account for over 900 billion in market cap. Except for Tesla, and in a much smaller way, Beam, none of those companies offer any degree of zero emission charging. In contrast, my patented pollution-free wind and solar tower is privately held and valued well below the market cap of any of its listed competitors. The bottom line is, without zero emission charging, there can be no zero emission vehicles. My contribution to all of this is the wind and solar tower. The wind and solar tower is a subset of renewable energy. It is not the end all answer, but it has the ability to reduce EV charging related CO2 emissions. To make the ideal of zero emissions vehicles a reality, EV charging hardware and software is contained in my patented electricity generating system. It is powered by a combination of wind and sun, the only one in the world, and that system was successfully field tested for over five years in Pennsylvania producing electricity in a variety of conditions and surviving two hurricanes. The unique renewable energy generation system and ancillary hardware are located in a tower that can also house up to one megawatt of battery storage. As a result of its built-in generation capacity and ability to island from the electric grid when the grid is compromised, the WST is impervious to blackouts and brownouts and or utility cyber attacks. In addition to the humanitarian application in underdeveloped countries, the wind and solar tower is an ideal product for EV charging. Each tower can provide emissions-free charging away from home for over 11,000 cars per year with the ability to charge an infinite number of cars from grid power. However, Unlike grid-dependent chargers, WSTs can still charge EVs when the grid has failed from natural disasters or cyber attacks. For operators of EV charging stations, WSTs 
make on-site electricity at a fraction of what utility power costs. Simply stated, earnings are vastly increased when your raw material cost, cost is cut by 50%. Since WSTs do not require grid connection, they can be installed where there is no utility power. However, when connected to the grid, WSTs, the wind and solar tower, can serve as a distributed energy, pollution-free energy source. The WST is the first and only commercial grade EV charger powered by both wind and sun. It is also the first and only charger capable of providing level four DC 380 kilowatt, 1000 volt EV charges. With charging capacities of 380 kilowatts and up to 1,000 volts, the WST can charge an EV at rates that rival filling a fuel tank. For example, a 15-minute charge provides 328 miles of range. Each tower provides 11,458 charges per year. Each tower also generates 229,000 kilowatt hours and requires no grid connection. From an environmental perspective, each tower prevents 292,000 tons of power, of tons of, of, of CO2 from entering the atmosphere. This is significant because, like I've said before, 60.8% of electricity that powers EV chargers is created by burning coal, oil, and natural gas. Also, each tower provides enough electricity for over for 782,000 miles of pol emission-free, pollution-free, zero emission driving. I'm going to touch on a couple of other advantages here, which is the wind and solar tower is the only EV charger that acts that actively averts climate change uh, by using wind and sun to generate electricity. The wind and solar tower produces pollution-free electricity on site. It also generates extraordinary income streams for operators in the form of carbon tax credits and wind production tax credits. The cost is extremely low, produces electricity at a levelized cost of energy of only 4.25 cents per kilowatt hour, which is less than what anyone can buy electricity uh, from a power uh, company. And with subsidies, WSTs produce electricity at an LCOE of eight tenths of a penny. So that's less than one tenth the cost of other EV chargers. Also, wind and solar towers protect operators and customers from blackouts and brownouts. Look, worldwide socioeconomic progress is a double-edged sword. CO2 emissions are a worldwide problem that cannot be solved by any one country. For every benefit that civilization and industrialization have given to the world, there is a corresponding downside. Today, you've heard me talk about increased sat CO2 saturations. And I assume that you've heard that from other sources. With that in mind, I ask you not to take me at my word, but to read the science, to gather enough information to be able to make your own judgment. My 100% emission-free hybrid power station is but one way, just one step toward averting climate change. I hope that I have convinced you that EVs cannot be green unless and until the power used to charge them is green. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Jim. That was uh, extremely interesting and brought a lot of insights. Um, I, I would like to understand the system better. I just want to ask you a couple of questions. Sure. Um, what happens if you're charging in a location like that and bad weather, no sun, 
no wind. So how does it work when, when you have to deal with bad weather and trying to charge your cars? Well, actually, the, the wind and solar tower uh, comes standard with uh, uh, 120 kilowatts of uh, battery storage, but uh, it has the capacity to uh, contain up to a megawatt of batteries. So in other words, if, even if it's bad weather, there's enough stored energy there to help it continue working. That's correct. Yeah. And if you're comparing, uh, you know, solar panels and wind towers to this, how much more energy do the two together produce compared to the usual solar panels and, and wind towers? Well, I mean, there, there, there's no magic. There's no secret sauce to solar panels. Uh, you know, solar panels, uh, uh, for the most part, you know, unless you get into the ones that are used by NASA and things like that, uh, make a specific amount of electricity per square foot. In our case, we have over 1,500 square feet of solar panel. But what's more significant about our solar panel is the simple fact that we have the world's only self-cleaning and self-cooling solar panel. And you might ask, well, what's that have, have to do with anything? Uh, I think that it was uh, MIT or one of those schools uh, that uh, uh, did a study and they found that after only 30 days uh, in certain locations, solar panels would lose up to 30% of their efficiency because of dust buildup. So my, my patented self-cleaning feature uh, provides a, a cure for that. And my self-cooling feature actually provides a, a cure for, uh, against overheating because solar panels are light, are heat sensitive. Yeah, I, uh, I see really see the advantages. And when you talk about cars, you know, electric cars eliminating pollution, you made a very big point. And also, you know, you have to remember that you have to build the batteries. You have to excavate land in different parts of the world to get your lithium and other things. <laughs> and when the batteries are finished, you have to recycle them. You have to do something with them because there are other potential sources of pollution in dealing with those things. So. We need to go towards electric vehicles, but going the way you're recommending really makes sense. So I thank you very much and uh, look forward to learning more and seeing you again soon. Likewise. Thank you so much. Thank you very much.